I want to take our minds back. Some of us haven't been there. Some of us lived there. How many of us remember the old big tube TV? <laughs> yes. Well, I want to take you back into memory. Before flat screen TVs and, and before all the new technology, there were these other things called TVs that looked a lot bigger. In fact, they were so big, they looked like a piece of furniture in your house. You didn't move it. And they didn't have remotes, if you're wondering. And they didn't have cable TV, if you're wondering. None of those things came with it. And I, I can remember back having four channels, maybe five. Two, 11, 13, 45, and sometimes 22. That's about it. And I remember as a child uh, having a lot of exercise, and I didn't even need to leave the house because Dad would say, you want to change that channel? I was the remote. Well, that's how it worked when, back in the day. It, it was interesting. And also the phone. Let's talk about the phone for a minute. We had the, the dial phone. You took it and you cranked it. Rotary yeah, rotary dial. Six, three, six, seven. I could have called four people by time. I dialed a number in with my smartphone today. It's unbelievable where technology has taken us. And my favorite's the typewriter. I remember sitting in class, and we had typewriters. We took typing class, and you actually sat in front of a typewriter, and you pecked away on it, and poop, poop, poop. And I remember typing papers up, and you'd be typing along, oh, you have to white it out, try to bring it back where it's supposed to be, hit it again, you mess up, pull it out, crumble up, throw it, and you start over. And, and I remember typing papers up. If I typed the word wrong, I didn't even care anymore. I just turned it in and hoped the teacher didn't catch it. I mean, that's how it was, the old typewriter. But thank God for technology, amen? Technology has taken us down a long path, and it has changed everything. Now you have the flat screen TV, and nobody even gets up anymore. In fact, you don't even hit the remote anymore. You just talk to it. I like to watch James Bond. There it is. It's on. And the smartphone, so nice. Tap, highlight, paste, print. So nice. No more typewriters. It, throw them out, crash them, go to a museum, look at them, whatever you want to do, that's where they are. But we're a different generation. We're the copy and paste generation. We highlight things, we copy it, we paste it. In fact, many people get in trouble in college now because that's all they do. <laughs> we're the copy and paste generation. At the click of a button or the swipe of a finger, we can find that text, put it down, print it out, boom, have it right in front of us. I wish Christianity was so simple. Hey Amen. I wish it was that simple. We bring a babe in. We hit a couple buttons. We swipe a couple swipes. And there they are. They're mature Christians. They're ready to go. It's just not so. Actually, it's like having a baby. I remember the first baby we had. We, uh, you know, we were celebrating and I don't know, do you have anything, somebody, do you have plans at home after you come home with the baby? Some people like to celebrate, you know, like, okay, we had a baby, we're home, let's cook a steak on the grill, and let's celebrate this. So, you know, you get the steak out, you cook them up, and put them out, and it's a steak for dad, a steak for mom, and a steak for the baby, right? I mean, just chow right into that thing, right? It doesn't work that way, does it? It's a process. And it takes a while to work them to the point where they're eating meat. In fact, it's interesting watching children. As they, as they first come home, you know how it is. Baby, feed them the Bible, a bottle, burp them, diaper them. I mean, that's what it seemed like to me. Bottle, burp, diaper. Bottle, burp, diaper. And then at night... Bottle, burp, diaper, cry. <laughs> Don't want to go to bed. Just cry her eyes out. 
In fact, that's how it was for us. This cried right. 7.30 every night, it was on. <laughs> they called it colic. I don't know what it was. Don't you wish things were simple? Let's take this into the realm of Christians. The baby comes out of the baptistry, and we want them to we want them to do everything right, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. We want them to come out. We want them to be smart. We want them to do things. We want them to be little Jesus is everywhere. But it just doesn't work out that way, does it? There's a process. And that process takes time. And it takes effort on both sides. On the babe and the teacher or the friend or whomever's disciple them along. It just takes a lot of effort. Christianity is a process. A process of growing. And today I want us to open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I want to take a look at how Paul put things together. You know, Paul's the guy. If you want to learn how to disciple someone, I think he's the second best in the world. Everybody knows who the first best is, right? Jesus himself. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians and we'll begin there. We'll read 10 verses and we're going to focus on 5 through 8 through this sermon. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, interesting, you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience, and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, and I love this, so that we do not need to say anything. (whistles) What a statement. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Amen. Today I want to focus on those, those verses 5 through 8. And what I want to give you is Paul knew exactly what he was saying here. When you begin to break this down and look in the Greek, you begin to see some interesting things. Paul has chosen his words very carefully. He was intentional in his wording. You have in verse 6, me, my tie. Does that sound familiar? Me, my tie. Mimic. To mimic. To, to copy, to look at, to mimic. The, oh, I think I could do that. Verse 6. Verse 7. To pass. To pass. It's to boom. Strike an image. Strike an image like your typewriter. Strikes that letter. Strikes that letter. To pass. He continues on. Decomai. Literally. You took it in. You breathed it in. It became part of you. And then he continues on in there and he says, ex kamai. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like the same word. Listen to the kamai, kamai, echo. We get the word echo from it. You echoed it out. You sounded the message out. You breathed it in. You echoed it out. You breathe it in. You echo it out. That's what Paul's throwing at us in here. And in this little text, we begin to see a picture of discipleship. We begin to see how the church works. We begin to see things unfold in Thessalonica. I'm sure you've heard sermons from Gary on discipleship. You've heard sermons probably from from David Fry on discipleship. You've heard sermons from Clyde on discipleship. I'm sure Rick has preached on it. I'm sure Billy preached on it. I'm not the first guy to talk about discipleship around here. In fact, I sat in classes under, underneath of many people in discipleship, Clyde being one of them. It's the heart and soul of the church. 
Amen? That's how the church grows. That's how the church grew in the first century. That's how the church grows today. And that's how the church will grow tomorrow by the process of discipleship. So let's take a look and see what Paul has to say here. He gives us some good ideas to consider. Number one, disciples or Christians need an example to follow. It's right there in in verse 5. You know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Literally, what he's saying is, you saw how we lived. You watched us. You had an example before you, and your eyes were laid on us, and you learned how to live the life because of us. I always find that interesting when I read that passage. Does anyone remember Paul's ministry in Thessalonica? Three sermons in a riot. That's all it was. He spoke to him three times. It was a big riot. Jason comes to his rescue. That's it. That was the whole ministry of Thessalonica. Three weeks. So we must be missing something, huh? We just get the highlights in the book of Acts. And sometimes we forget there's more than meets the eye. We have the three sermons in the riot. But what was he doing all those other days? Well, evidently he was living with Jason. (laughs) Evidently they were watching how he lived out his life. Evidently they were just looking at his example. This is how the Apostle Paul lives. They were watching and they were taking it in and they were enjoying it and they were learning from it and they were saying, whoa, this guy's something else. See, it's in those private moments, not so much the moments here or in Sunday school, although I believe Sunday school helps people grow more than even a sermon. I'm an advocate of it. You can talk about things more often, and and you can bring things up and flesh things out a little more. But it's in more of those private moments, and I can tell you I've had a few of them, many at George's house, where we would just sit and learn. With Clyde, sit and learn. It was those moments that helped me more than most of the other moments. And... I know you didn't see me a lot in Sunday school when I was here. You know why? Because the, cho- the class I chose was different than everyone else's. I didn't go to the young adult class. I chose to go to the MIC class. I chose to go with the mature in Christ class. And I did it for a reason. Because I wanted to see how they lived. And I wanted to inspect their lives. They have lived it. They've been there. They've done it. And so many times I was sitting in there with Joe. Joe Gibbs. I I can't tell you for many, many, many years that that's the class I was in. You never saw me in the other ones because that's the one I wanted to be in. Why? Well, he challenged us. Hey, you guys want to memorize the book of James? Oh, that's the Sunday school class. You want to memorize this passage? You want to memorize this passage? You want to memorize this book? They were the type of challenges in the class that I was looking for. And I was receiving them. And then Joe would have all those fellowships. Oh, boy, did I love the fellowships. Now, Joe will tell you, I was quite the radical when I first came here. I was a little bit different than I am now. And uh, he would tell you he had a few talks with me as an elder. In fact, almost all the elders had a few talks with me when they were elders. But uh, that's just how it was. But I would go to his house, and there's Joe, and there's Billy, and there's all the mature Christians, and I'd watch them live. I'd see how they interacted, and I'd watch Henry eat flowers. I thought to myself, oh, I don't think I want to eat flowers. And I'd watch Joe talk, and, and I'd watch Joe teach, and I'd watch how they interacted with each other and with us. And, and, I, and I, was, I was taking all that in. I was soaking it in. I was watching the example and soaking it up. And I loved to go over there, and they had this little bowl there full of chocolates. Boy, do I love chocolate. And I'd grab that little chocolate, and I'd pop it in my mouth. (laughs) That's the worst thing I ever tasted in my life. It was them beans, coffee beans with chocolate on them. He did it for fun just to watch me. I know he did. (laughs) 
But it was those times where I was learning how to live the life. Not so much when I heard a sermon, but when I was actually living with others and, and, and eating with others and watching how others interacted with each other. They were the moments that were molding me. Not so much just sitting and hearing a sermon. Those moments impacted me more than any others. They were the moments that molded me into who I am today. But look at our text. Paul, in his boldness, says this. You know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. For whose sake? For your sake. This was for you. I'm living like this for a reason. So you can watch me and you can learn how to be a Christian and you can be different. I'm living for you. What a statement. How many of us are bold enough to say that? How many of us are bold enough to say, I'd like you to start coming to Bible study at my house because I want you to see how I live. Whew. Woo. They're strong words, aren't they? Why aren't we saying them? I understand if you're a young Christian and you're not saying it. Why aren't we saying that as mature Christians now? Why aren't we grabbing people up? I'm not just going to put this on those people. It's also part of those coming up. Do you want that? Do you want to be part of that fellowship? Do you want to be with them? Do you want to learn from them? It's a, it's a two-sided story here. But Christianity begins by watching someone else live out their life. That's where we learn. We see somebody put faith on flesh and flesh on faith. We see them working out their life, working out their own salvation right in front of our own eyes. That's where we begin to learn, begin to watch, we begin to see, we begin to move. And then we begin to live like them. Point number two, Christians are to become emulators. We're not just to watch. I, I know it's so much more fun just to watch, isn't it? Spectator, spectators is always, always have more fun, don't they? Let's just be honest. We're not on the field. We're not getting hurt. We're not getting beat up. It, it, it's easier to spectate. But that's not where it's supposed to go. Verse 6 there. That's where he uses that word. And you have become my my tie. That's the word right there. Followers, mimics. Some translations might say imitators. There it is. We become mimickers. We watch how they live, and then we act how they live. We take their good attributes, their Christian attributes, into our own lives, and we begin to watch and begin to implement and begin to use those for the benefit of God. Now I'm going to show you how easy it is. Are you ready for this? You ever heard of a game called Simon Says? Now let's play. All right. Simon Says, put your hand up. Simon Says, put your other hand up. Simon Says, put them down. Simon Says, put a hand back up. Put it down. Oh, oh. You know, the devil might be trying to trick you sometimes. You have to be careful. All right, Simon says it's over. <laughs> it, it's that simple. You watch and you do. You watch and you copy. You watch and you mimic. You bring part of what they do into your life. Let's be honest. As Christians, should we all be living a similar life? We should. We should all be real close in our lifestyles. doesn't mean we're exactly the same, but there are things we should be doing that are the same. How about reading? How about studying a little? How about not doing things we used to do before we were Christians? There are certain things that all of us should be doing that are the same. We should be studying. We should be reading. We should be praying. They're attributes that all Christians have. 
We should be becoming emulators. We should be modeling our life. But we have to be careful, right? It's easy to model something that's wrong. Bob and I were talking about this just before service. It's, easier, it's easy to hear something and take it at face value and just say it. Well, well, not, well it might not be true. And the example was, you know, they talked about um, Bloomberg gave $50 million, and if, you know, they broke it down, everybody could have a million dollars each, and that was an untrue statement. I don't know if you read that in the news, it's an untrue statement. You would have got about $1.47. So we have to be careful what we hear and how we take it in. We have to judge those things. Be careful who we imitate. Now, if we could just stop right there, Christianity would be easy, right? We just watch and we just do. Oh, I can do that. I can, I can watch somebody live like that and then I can become like that. It would be so much easier, wouldn't it? If Christianity stopped right here at this level, the Apostle Paul cut the text off, it would be an easy life as a Christian. But he doesn't cut the text off. He takes us to the next level. Point three is Christians are to become those examples. See, we're not to just copy and paste. We're to print. That's where we need to go. We copy, we paste, and we print something out for someone else to see. Paul's raising the bar here. We are now supposed to be the one who says, watch my life. Copy my life. Follow my life. This is where we get that word to pass. And he uses that in, in verse 7. Basically, it's this. You're to stamp an image. You're to stamp an image. You're to stamp an image everywhere you go. And that image is the image of Christ. When you go to the grocery store, <clears throat> You're stamping the image of Christ. When you go to work, you're stamping the image of Christ. When you come to church, obviously we're going to stamp an image here, amen? It's easy here. But when we go out there, we're going to be stamping an image all over the world. And that image is supposed to look just like Christ or just like the Apostle Paul who's copying Christ or the elder who's copying Christ. We're to stamp an image and that image is also supposed to look just like Christ. We're supposed to stamp the image everywhere. Oh, 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 what are you saying? We're supposed to be perfect? That isn't what I'm saying. But here's what I am saying. Perhaps we need to try harder. Perhaps we need to be more conscious of the image we're stamping all over the world. Perhaps we need to be smarter in the things we do and say in public. See, Paul's calling us to a totally different standard here. We're not to be satisfied with good enough. And I'll be honest with you, good enough is usually what we strive for, isn't it? That was good enough. That's the best I could do. What's well, the best you could do? You couldn't do better? Well, I guess I could if I studied more. I guess I could if I thought about things a little more. Think about the word right there in verse 7. So that you became examples to pass. You became an image that stamped out on the world. And that's exactly what he's saying in the verse. So that you became examples to all Macedonia and Achaia. You began to stamp your image all over the world. And the world took notice. So much so that guess who didn't have to say anything? The apostles. The apostles didn't have to say anything because of how the Thessalonians were living? Wow. What a statement. What kind of image are we stamping on the world? Are we an image at home, in front of our children, in front of our grandchildren? 
Are we an image at work? Or sometimes it can be difficult, let's be honest. There can be a lot of abrasive people in the world, especially against Christians and Christianity. What kind of image are you stamping there? The Apostle Paul basically said, I'm strutting my stuff so you can see it. That's what he said in the text. I'm living this life for you to watch. I'm stamping this image for you to see. I'm interested in you seeing who I am so you can stamp the same image somewhere else. Strong words. I encourage you, model Christianity. Model every place you go. Be a little Jesus everywhere you go. Stamp an image on everyone you know. And perhaps one day we'll be able to say what Brother Don DeWelt said. I've never met a person who hasn't heard the gospel. That's stamping an image wherever you go. Now Paul could have stopped there also. He could have said, well, that's good enough. But is the Apostle Paul that kind of person? No. The Apostle Paul has never stopped it. That's good enough. He doesn't even know what that means. He continues to press on no matter what. Basically, Paul is saying, watch me, copy me, stamp it out. Watch me, copy me, stamp it out. And then he presses even further. He encourages them to move on. And he leaves us with two key words in our text. The next word is decomai. That's that word, breathe it in. Take it in. Bring it to your inner core. That's point four here. Christians, take in that message. Christians, to breathe in that message. Uh, a literal re- rendering is, take hold of it. Grab it. Grab hold of the message. Now, what message are we talking about? That's probably a good question to ask at this point. What in the world are we talking about? Grab what? Well, how about verse 5 for our gospel? Grab hold of the gospel message. Just grab hold of it. Bring it into your inner core. Let it be the, in, in the very fabric of your being. That, that's what he's saying. Grab hold of this message and bring it in and let it be part of you. Bring it to your inner core. You've seen the shirts out there. Eat, sleep, race, repeat. Eat, sleep, swim, repeat. Whatever sport you're into, you've seen them. Eat, sleep, whatever, repeat. Perhaps we need to get some shirts. Eat, sleep, Christianity, repeat. Perhaps we need to invest in some shirts and, and wear them as reminders to ourselves and others in the world. But that's what he's saying. Breathe it in. If we were to have a quiz today, a pop quiz, one you're not prepared for, as always, How would you fare if someone began to ask you to explain to me the gospel? Give me all the facts about the gospel. It's more than just a death, burial, and resurrection. That's a good starting point. You need to know that. But there's a whole lot more in the gospel. That's what Paul gave them, and look at the life they lived. What are you breathing in? That's the question to ponder. How would you fare on a quiz? What have you breathed into your soul? What's part of your inner core, your inner fabric? Or are we going out hunting without ammo? What are you going to do hunting without ammo? Take pictures? Did your phone out and take pictures? Look at this one I missed. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, another beauty. Oh, might have been the Maryland State record. Didn't have ammo. No ammo at all. What are we doing? What am I doing with my Christianity? What am I breathing in? Where am I failing? How can I be different? Is the gospel part of your core? Everywhere you go, is it shared? Are you sharing, Jesus saved me? Are you sharing your life? See, that's what discipleship really is. That's where the core really comes in. When it, when it becomes a piece of you and you share it with someone else. That's when people really see something to copy. And they begin to say to themselves, maybe I want some of that. That was one of Ed Bowsman's favorite lines. They'd see me live and say, maybe I want some of that. See, he talked about those things. Well, they watch how you live and then they say, let me have some of that. Are you living that kind of life? Where they see the gospel and the Christian message in you and they say, I want some of that. I like to have some of that. It implies that we're spending time studying and reading and learning the core values of Christianity. I'm not talking about the deep things here. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the core values. That's all Paul said. He spent three weeks with them. How much did he teach them? The core values of Christianity. That's all he could have taught. And of course, Paul doesn't let us stay there. The next word in verse 8 there. For from you the word of the Lord sounded the word of the Lord sounded forth. That word sounded forth is an interesting word. If I was to translate it into English, you'd know it immediately. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It's an echo. That's literally what it means. It's an echo. The word echoed out. It came from your core and echoed out. You took it in, you breathed it out, you echoed it everywhere you went. And this is one, a blast from the past. It's a, well, it's a perfect passive indicative verb. What's that mean? I don't know. Now, here's what it means. It happened in the past. It's present today. It'll be present into the future. It's continuing. It's going forever. The message is supposed to do what? Echo out forever. Out of what? Oh, out of our mouths. It should be echoing everywhere we go. We should be an echo. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. We should be sharing it everywhere. That should be our our, our daily job. It's a sound reflection. It's a noise reflecting to someone else. We played that little game, the telephone game before. We've all played it. We won't play it now. But that's what we're talking about. It's an echo. Now, I've heard a lot of things about the church, and I'm sure you have too. I want to give you a couple sayings. The measure of the church is their ascending capacity, not our seating capacity. It sounds good, but is it true? The measure of the church is her maturity. The measure of her church is her biblical knowledge. You fill in the blank. You've heard them all, right? Well, there may be some truth to them, but let's be honest. What is the measure of the church? What's the real measure of the church? How could we actually measure what the church is doing? Hmm. What's the sermon one? Discipleship. The real measure of the church is how are people progressing along in their Christianity? 
How are they sharing their Christianity? What are we doing with the Christian life? Luke said it this way. You've heard it once or twice. Then he opened his mind. They opened their, Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. That Christ will suffer and raise from the dead on the third day. And guess what we'll preach? Be preached everywhere. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. Perhaps you know this one a little better. The Matthew passage. Jesus came and said to them, All authority has been given to me on earth and in heaven. Go therefore and do what? Oh, make disciples. Perhaps that's the measuring stick we should use with the church. Is how are we doing at disciple making? Are we giving them an image to copy? Are we being an example? Are we teaching them to mimic? Are we teaching them to live it out? Are we, are we teaching them to breathe it in? Are we teaching them to echo it out? Perhaps that's the measurement of a church. That's what Paul praised, and that's what he's doing to the Thessalonians. That's what Paul praised the Thessalonians for. You've become so good at this. You've become so great at sharing. You've become the best over there in Thessalonica that guess what? We're no longer needed. We don't need apostles over here. <laughs> you've done it. You've progressed to the point where you've replaced us. And I think that's the measure. When we progress these little babies to the point where they replace us. Because we're all growing older. And we're all going to leave. And who's going to be behind? The next generation. Are we disciple makers? See, the message of the church is to make disciples. It's always been the same. It's never been different. Oh, yeah, we may package it a little bit different here and package it a little bit different there. But really, it's about making more Christians, productive Christians. So Christians, here's my encouragement. You knew we were going somewhere, right? If you're a mature Christian, find someone who's not mature and attach yourself to them. I know it's nice to fellowship, and, and I'm not saying don't fellowship with your peers, because we need that too. But what I am saying is make time for someone who's younger who could use an example. I'm not just going to leave it on the mature Christians. Over here, the young babe. When the young babe comes out of the baptistry, you have a responsibility too. To find that person. You should be looking just as hard as they're looking. I, I was groping for that person when I came out of the baptistry. I followed whoever I could follow until I found the one I wanted to follow. Grab hold of a mature Christian and follow them. I can guarantee you they want to help you. <laughs> I can guarantee you they want to see you grow. They want to see you mature. They want to see you be fruitful. They want to see you copy them and paste. Another.